Okay, so um, I hope you can all hear me well. Um, so welcome to this session, Machine Learning in the Browser with the TensorFlow JS. Uh, my name is Håkan Sibnagel. I am a Microsoft AI MVP and also manager for AI and big data. So, but before we start with the session, I'm just gonna give you some background info about, um, about me. Um, so as I said, I work as a manager for AI and Big Data at Miles, a new reading consultancy company, and I'm also quite involved in the local user community. So uh, I'm part of the Norwegian.net user group. I'm also part of Astro User Group Sweden, and I'm also an organizer for Oslo AI, and I'm running my own uh, online AI school called AI42 together with two other AI MEPs, uh, Epardia and Gosia Borseka. I'm a Microsoft MEP and also a certified trainer. And you can find my, if you want to reach me, you can find my social information on uh, these links that you can see on this slide. But then today's topic is about um, machine learning and how you can run machine learning in the browser using uh, TensorFlow.js. Um, so as part of today's session, we will have two different demos. In the, our first demo, we will build an application from scratch in the browser just using, just using JavaScript. And we will analyze a problem here. So we will analyze the data and we will see, can we build a machine algorithm that will try to predict uh, a specific value here that in a specific situation that I'm going to show you in a while. And then we also have a second demo. In our second demo, we will make use of an already existing uh, machine learning um, algorithm that we can use out of the box. And we're gonna be using that in order to build our own image classifier that we can also run in the browser. Um, and if you have any questions here, uh, just put them into, into the session chat and I will look at that within, with regular intervals. But first of all, just to get everyone here on the, to the same page, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background here into what machine learning actually is. So you might think here that machine learning is something totally brand new because it's such a hot topic today. Uh, but uh, as a matter of fact, it stems all the way back to the 1950s. So, uh, so there was a researcher called Arthur Samuel. He said that machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And we can also say that machine learning is sort of a pattern recognition in, in historical data. And some of the ways that we can use machine learning today is to do prediction. So classic example here is if you have a data set with house information, so you get uh, the year the house was built, how big is the house, how many rooms, in which neighborhood, and then based on these different types of facts, then you can predict how much will a house cost if you try to sell it on the open market in a specific region. And you can also think of recommendation engines, like when you go to when you go to a web store and you order something, then probably you will have some recommendations on that page that says that people who bought this item, they have also bought these items, so maybe you're interested in that. And that's also a good example of machine learning. And you can also think about clustering, uh, say that again, that you have a store and you want to send out some more customized information to your customer. Uh, then you can uh, then you can use a clustering algorithm that can divide your customer group into different smaller clusters so that you can send out much more uh, specific information to them. Then we also have image recognition, text recognition, and also speech recognition. Now, one way that we can do machine learning is called supervised learning. And the idea with supervised learning is that you have access to historical data, you can say historical input data, and we also have access to the result, the historical output data. And then based on this historical data, we can build a machine learning model and we can train this model, and then we can expose this model to new data that is never that it has never seen before. So we can use real-time data, and then our model will do a prediction, for example, on that real-time data and give back a recommendation. But as I said here in the start, um, uh, I said that machine learning dates back to the 1950s. Uh, so the question is, why is this such a hot topic today? And there's a number of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is 
uh, technology. That technology has evolved a lot since that time. So today we have access to sensors. Uh, we have sensor technology so that we can get lots of data that we need in order to do our machine learning. And we also have uh, big data solutions running in the cloud that we can make use of. We have machine learning algorithms that we as developers can use just through an API call. And we also have various API and services that we can use from the different cloud vendors. And just for completeness, uh, I would also like to touch about the languages for machine learning. So you can actually do machine learning in any type of language, but you don't really want to do that because you want to make use of a language where you already have libraries and tools uh, that are targeted again to machine learning. So two of the most commonly used languages are Python and R. So historically, Python has been more uh, popular among people coming from a computer science background, whereas R has been more popular among people coming from more statistical or mathematical background and is also widely used in academia. So now when we have a sort of a basic understanding here of what machine learning is, then now we can start to talk about TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is an open source library that was developed by the Google Brain team, and it expresses its algorithms using something called tensor operations. So I'm going to go through soon what the tensor actually is. And one of the main things here with TensorFlow is that it supports distributed computing. And that matters a lot now if you want to run deep learning or, or neural networks. Uh, but first of all, what is actually a tensor? So tensor is um, something that is taken from the world of mathematics. So in mathematics, we can distinguish between either a scalar, which is just a single real-time number. We can talk about the vector, which is like a, um, a one-dimensional collection of uh, numbers. Or we can talk about the matrix, which is like a two-dimensional um, container for, uh, for numbers. And then a tensor is just a container that can either contain a scalar, vectors, or matrices. So it's just sort of a container for these different uh, items. And if you use regular TensorFlow, uh, so, so tensor, uh, TensorFlow comes in three different flavors. We have TensorFlow, uh, which is uh, a Python library, and we have TensorFlow.js, which is for uh, use in JavaScript, and then we have TensorFlow Lite, which you can use on small embedded machines. But if you use uh, the regular TensorFlow in, uh, for example, a Python Jupyter notebook, then this is what it would look like. So you import TensorFlow as TF, and then you start up a session, and then you define some constants. Like, for example, here we've defined A and B with the value A is defined as 10 and B is 32. And then you can do some mathematical operations. So, for example, here we run A plus B and we print it out on the console. But now we can go into TensorFlow.js. So TensorFlow.js is a JavaScript library so that you can both train and deploy your models in the browser or on a Node.js application. So then we've actually reached our first demo here. But before we, before we start on that, uh, I will just have a check here if there are any questions here. It, uh, no, it doesn't seem to be any questions here. So let me switch back. Um, so let me switch over here to my um, to my browser. Uh, one moment here. Yes. Actually, I can switch over here to Visual Studio Code. So here we have a Visual Studio Code uh, project here. So we want to use uh, we want to be able to use TensorFlow here in the browser. So we just created an index.html file. And in this HTML file, we are referencing, we are importing TensorFlow.js from a CDN here. And we also import something called TensorFlow.js vis, which stands for a visualizer. So we're going to have a look here in a short time what this visualizer actually does. And then we import our main JavaScript file. So this is where we will do all our, all our machine learning stuff in this script.js file. And this is all here for this index.html file. And then if we go have a look into our script.js file, then uh, the only thing we do here is we just print out hello TensorFlow on the console log. So let us switch over here to our browser and then, and then we, can, uh, we can run this. So then we can see here that this prints out hello TensorFlow. So then we know that this library is 
uh, has been loaded and we know that our application works so uh, uh, so far. Uh, but the thing is here that in order for us to do something useful with machine learning, we need to have access to data. So luckily for us, we uh, have some data here um, as part of a JSON file. So this is um, uh, this is some car data with different information or data about the car. So we can see, for example, we can see the miles per gallon, the cylinders of a car, horsepower, and which year it was built, and so on. So one of the things that we would like to see here is can we make use of uh, of the miles per gallon and the horsepower and see if there is some sort of a relationship between miles per gallon and horsepower. Because if, if there is, then we would, for example, be able to predict, uh, given a specific horsepower, we will be able to predict the miles per gallon. So, um, so the first thing that we would like to do is we would like to be able to load this data set into our JavaScript application, and then we would like to be able to plot it to, uh, to do a, a preliminary data analysis of our data. Um, so then let us uh, define here a function called get data and um, in order to retrieve uh, the data from the JSON file. Here in our get data function, what we do is we do a fetch on this JSON file and we load it in into, uh, into a constant here, course data. And uh, then after that, we just clean it up a little bit because uh, so we map it so that we get something we call miles MPG that stands for the miles per gallon. And then we have something that we call horsepower, which stands for the horsepower in the data set. And we also filter out the null values because, because we don't want to have them. So we do a little bit of filtering here before we start. And then the next thing that we want to do, uh, we need to define here sort of a run function to, so that our application can actually run. Um, here, what we do here is the first thing that we do in a run function is we uh, we call this get data function so that we can load our JSON data, our car data. And uh, then after that, we map it so that we get the horsepower on the X, uh, X values and the miles per gallon on the Y. Uh, values. And then we're making use of this TensorFlow visualization component that I was referring to. Uh, so we can just call TensorFlow vis.render and then the type of plot that we want to render. So in this case, we want to render a scatter plot because we want to try to see is there some sort of relationship between, uh, between mice per gallon and horsepower. And then we will add more code will be added here as this example evolves. And then finally, we need to define an event listener. So we call document add event listener, and we're listening to this event here, dome content loaded. So when all the content has been loaded, then it will uh, run this function here. Um, so let me save this, and then we can go back to the browser. And uh, let me switch over to the uh, right window. Um, so now we can see here that without us having to explicitly program anything, we actually got a really nice uh, scatter plot here on the right-hand side. So what we can see here is on, um, on the x-axis, we have the horsepower, and then on the y-axis, we have the miles per gallon. And then our question was here, uh, is there any sort of relationship between miles per gallon and horsepower? Because if we can find a relationship, or if there seems to be a relationship, then we can use machine learning in order to predict a miles per gallon given a new horsepower, we can predict what will the miles per gallon be for that horsepower. And luckily for us, we can see that you can see that there is some sort of a slope. So that seems to be some sort of a relationship here between miles per gallon and horsepower. And that's a good thing because let's say that, uh, let's say that the data would have been all scattered around our plot. That would have meant that there is actually no relationship between miles per gallon and horsepower. So that would have been a bad case for machine learning because there is no relationship for our machine learning algorithm to learn. So uh, we would, uh, we would ha uh, not have had any good results. But now we can see that here there is a relationship. So then we can construct a machine learning algorithm that will learn this relationship so that we can predict a new value. Um, so, um, yeah, so the goal here is that we want to train a machine learning model where the input is the horsepower, uh, 
and then the prediction is the miles per gallon here. So what we'll do is we'll use these values that we have, uh, this JSON file that we have, and we will feed them into something called a neural network, which is a specific type of a machine learning algorithm. And then this neural network will learn from these examples so that it will be able to predict a new miles per gallon from a horsepower. And this is an example of supervised learning that we were talking about here in, in the presentation. So now in machine learning terms, the first thing that we want to do is we want to define the model architecture. So the model architecture is we will decide what kind of algorithm should our machine learning model use in order to compute its answers. So in the machine learning uh, terms, machine learning models, they are algorithms that it takes an input and then it will produce an output. And in this case, we will use something called a neural network. And here, this the algorithm will be a layer of neurons with different types of weights that will decide what will the output be. So during our training process, our machine learning algorithm will learn the best values for these weights. So then let us add a function here where we can create we can create the model here to our JavaScript. We define a function in here. Let's create So in this function, uh, we first uh, create the model here uh, by using by using our TensorFlow um, library. So we call TensorFlow.sequential. And sequential is the most simple model that we have in TensorFlow.js. And it's called sequential because we have an input that flows straight down to the output. And you can also have much more complex scenarios or complex models where you can have multiple input, multiple output, and different types of branches. But in this case, we, are, uh, we want to use a, sim a simple model as possible here. And then uh, the next thing that we do is we call model.add because we want to add an input layer here to our model. And this uh, input layer is connected to something that we call a dense layer. So a dense layer is a type of layer that will multiply its input with a matrix with its weights, and then it will add a number that we call a bias to the result. So since this is the first layer of our network, we need to specify the input shape here, which is one. And that means that we have one number as an input, and that is the horsepower of the car. And then we also set the units that sets how big will this weight matrix be in this layer. And here we also set it to one because we will have one weight for each one of the input features of the data. And then we create our output layer where we also set the units to one because we want to have one number as the output and that is the miles per gallon. And, uh, and then next, in order for us to actually use this, we need to be able to create an instance of this model. Let us go back to our, let us go back to our run function, yeah, which is over here. And And uh, here, what we do here is we create our model. And then after that, we are calling our TensorFlow visualization component. And we want to show something that is called a model summary. Uh, so let us see what that looks like. So we say this, and then we go over to our browser, and then run it. And if we go over here, we can see our scatter plot. And then here, we see something called a model summary. So for, uh, so for data scientists, for machine learning engineers, this is a, a very important tool for them to use because then they can see actually how does the machine learning model looks more into in detail. So we can see that there is a dense layer. We can see the output shape, how many number of parameters, and if that layer is trainable or not. So next thing that we uh, need to do here is now when we've defined our machine learning, learning algorithm or machine learning model, then we want to train it. But before we can train it, we need to do something with our data. Uh, because TensorFlow, it's uh, given its names because it only takes tensor as its input values. So we need to somehow, uh, we need to somehow convert our JSON data into tensors. So we need to do some sort of transformation here. So let us define a function uh, so that we can com can convert to tensor data. So so here we take in this data, which is this uh, JSON file, and then we do uh, two things here. Um, so the first thing that we do here 
is we are shuffling the data here because when we when we will do our training here we will divide our data set into smaller subgroups that we call batches so when we train our data we want our, these batches to be as representative as possible of the whole data set so we would like to have data from all across this data distribution and it has some advantages because if we don't do this, we can run into the risk that our machine learning algorithm will only learn things that are dependent on the order of the input data. And it will not be so sensitive to structures in different subgroups. Uh, let's say that for some reason, maybe you have a very high horsepower for the first half of the training data, but that would not be representative for the whole data set. But now since we're just, you know, we're sampling data from all across our data sets, so it's randomly distributed. We don't run into the risk that a machine learning algorithm will learn something that is actually not representative for the whole data set, data set. And then after that, we are converting our data here to tensors using a predefined function here, tf.tensor2d. So we get an input tensor and we get a label tensor. Um, uh, so the input tensor is the horsepower and then the label tensor is our miles per gallon. And then we're doing something that we call uh, normalization. Uh, so the normalization, the reason, uh, so the normalization, what we do here is that we want our data to be in, um, in the range here from zero to one. And the reason for that is uh, that a lot of these machine learning algorithms are designed to work with small numbers. So by doing this normalization, we don't run into any risk of having some problems later on. Uh, but that also means that um, when we get the results, we need to be able to convert it back to the same type of format as we had before. Um, so because of that, we're saving this input max, input mean, label max, and label mean in order to be able to convert it back after we've gotten our result from our machine learning algorithm. So now when we have our data uh, ready here, then we can construct a function here so that uh, for training our data. So uh, let us define it here. Here in our train, uh, uh, train the data here, uh, train model, then the first thing that we need to do is we need to compile our model because before we can start to use it. And we also need to set some, uh, some parameters here for our uh, model here. So we define an optimizer. So the optimizer is an algorithm that will decide uh, um, what kind of updates th does our model need when it sees new data. So there are many different types of optimizers in TensorFlow, but the Adam optimizer is sort of a standard optimizer and it's it's easy to use and require little configuration. Um, then we also define a loss function. So the loss function is sort of a quality function. So it will tell us how well does our machine le learning model actually perform? How good is it to be able to predict new values here? And then next, we also pick a batch size. So the batch size is how big will this small subset of our data be? And we pick epochs. So epochs is uh, how many times do we want our machine learning model to look at our entire data set? So here we will take 50 iterations through the whole data set. And then finally, we start our training loop here. We call model.fit. And then we can also define here a callback so that we can monitor our machine learning model. Um, so we again, we're using our TensorFlow visualization component and we define what uh, is the loss, loss function, what is the name and so on. And yep. Uh, so now we can monitor our, uh, uh, our training loop here. So there's a uh, second thing that we need to do here is actually to use this. So let us uh, go to our run function. Here we are using these functions that we've uh, that we made here. We convert our data to tensors, and then after that we separate so that we get our input with the source power and our labels, which is miles per gallon. And then we train our model using this train model function that we just saw. And then we write console log on the on the console when we're done training. Uh, so let's go back to the browser and let us run this. And we can see here. 
And we can see here that here we got updates uh, for our uh, machine learning uh, model when it trains. So on the x-axis, you can see the number of epochs, which we, which we set to 50. And we can see our loss function and our mean, mean uh, squared error function here. And we want to have these values as low as possible. So we can see, for example, 0 0.02 on our loss function. Uh, so let's say uh, that we are, uh, let's say that we're happy with this result here. Then the next thing that we want to do is we want to actually make some predictions. So we want to test our model and see how well does our model work on data that it has not seen before. So if we go back uh, to here and and uh, and over here, what we do here is we generate some uh, generate some new data here. Uh, uh, so we're generating 100 new examples that we will feed into our model. So 100 new examples of horsepower, and then we want to see what kind of miles per gallon will our machine learning model predict for us. So here is our x values, and then we just call model.predict in order to get our predictions. And then, as I said, we did this normalization, so we need to do an on normalization here in order to get it back into the right scale so that it actually has some meaning for us. And then finally, what we do is we render a scatter plot again here in order to be able to plot and see how well does our machine learning model perform. Um, so when we've done this, then we only need to call our function here. So um, let us go back to the run function and and let's go back to the browser, run this, and then we can see. So now it's it's uh, again it's doing its training here, and we should also say that you know this is just uh, an example. This is just an example. Uh, so. In a real um, in a real day usage, you don't need to train your machine learning model every time you run it, uh, but it's a good practice to do training with regular intervals so that you can see that your uh, uh, that your situation hasn't changed, so that you need to retrain your machine learning model. But you don't really need to do it every time you run it. So this is just for for simplicity's sake here. But here here we can see our prediction. So in blue. In blue, we have our data set, and then in the orange is the predicted values. But we can see here that it's not such a good prediction because uh, uh, our real data has some sort of a curvature, but our predictions is a straight line. So, um, uh, so maybe there's something that we can do about this. So we can try to create another type of uh, another type of model here instead uh, that will take this curve linear aspect into account. If we go back to um, we go back to our file here, and then we find where we define our machine learning model. Which is over here. And then we can this out. And then we define, you can see here that we define the same type of model, a sequential model, but we add many more layers. So for each layer that you add, a general statement is that you will be able to handle much more complicated uh, uh, situations. So uh, let's see if uh, now when we added some more uh, layers, if that can take this curve, curve linearity into account. So we've saved this and then we go back to our browser and then we run this again here. And then now we can see immediately see here in the model summary that it looks, looks much more complex here. We have many more layers and we have many more parameters and they are all trainable. And we can also see here that we, in our previous um, example, we reached something like 0 0.02, uh, but here we're, we're down to 0 0.01 and after just five epochs. So it reaches a lower value much faster than before. And then finally, we can also see here that yes, this uh, uh, this uh, new machine learning model seems to be work much more much better than our previous one because you can see here in this orange, it actually takes into account that our data has some sort of 
curvy, curve linear uh, relationship. Yes, so that is um, uh, that is the end here of our first uh, uh, demo here. And what I would like you to take away from this is that you can do a lot of things in the browser. You, we didn't need to program almost anything. We just need to use some predefined functions from both the TensorFlow uh, library and also the TensorFlow visualization library, uh, which made us be able to visualize this without having to write any code at all. Um, so let me go back and check here in the session. Yes, so now there are some questions here. here. Uh, how do you decide on which architecture to use? Does it depend on the data or the outcome? Uh, yeah, that's actually uh, something that comes more with experience. But uh, I think one good uh, one good rule of thumb here is to try to start out, start out with something which is very simple. And then you also have some tools where you can run many different types of scenarios with many different machine learning models. And then, uh, then that type of software will actually give you a recommendation on that you should actually use this machine learning model. So you don't, sometimes you don't need to do, to do that even by yourself. And is it common to resolve? Yes, yes. So we uh, uh, need to we need to save some data here so that that it has never seen here, so that we can do. Uh, do the testing on that data. So then let me uh, switch back here to uh, the presentation here. Yes. Um, yeah, so that is one way that you can do. We can use our, uh, the TensorFlow library in the browser. We can do the data analysis and all of that stuff in the browser. But another way that we can do is we can use an already existing model and we can uh, convert that model into a format that uh, TensorFlow.js understands. And then we can use it just out of the box and build upon that. So we're going to have an example here where we're building an image, uh, an image classifier, and we will make use of uh, something called a Keras H5 model, and we will um, convert that into the TensorFlow.js layers format. So there's a command tool that you can see here that is called TensorFlow.js converter, and you can just input your uh, Keras model, and then it will output a TensorFlow.js layers model. And you can see here some code here for do it in, how we can do this in Python, and then how we can use it then in our JavaScript file. But before we uh, start with that, we can uh, think you know, we can take a step back and then we can think about why would we want to use TensorFlow.js uh, from, uh, from the beginning here. So one of the things here is that you don't really need to learn a new language. You don't need to learn about Python or R or Conda or Jupyter Notebooks or anything of all of that. And you don't need to have any round trip between the client and server because everything, all of this happens actually on the client. And you can also claim that you use data is uh, it's more secure because it's local, so you don't run into a risk of having a man in the middle attack, for example. And uh, and again, you're using the browser, so the browser is something that a lot of people are very accustomed to use. Uh, so that could also be an advantage. And you ha have also easy access to you know to the sensors on your mobile phone, for example, to the web camera or the microphone on your computer or on your mobile phone. And then, as I said here, you can either you can uh, develop everything here from scratch, uh, which you can see on the right hand, develop machine learning with JavaScript, or you can run existing models. So you can just use off-the-shelf models, and then you can convert it, and then you can just use it as, it as it is. Or you can retrain existing models. So maybe you have a model which is generally very good at detecting cars, but maybe you want to detect a specific car brand, maybe Tesla, and then you can use your uh, um, uh, an existing model, and then you can retrain that model so that it is uh, more targeted against uh, Tesla cars. And here are some examples of some different models that are already existing that we can make use of. So that brings us here to our second example here. So let me um, let me go back here to uh, um, uh, to the browser, and then uh, let me refresh uh, this thing here. Yeah, so the way that this works here is <laughs> just have to wait a little bit here. Yes. So the way that this works here is that we can select here um, 
a file and uh, an image and then it will be able to recognize what is in the uh, image here. So uh, let me just uh, have a look here. Uh, Yeah, so let us select this uh, image, for example. And then we are selecting uh, the model here. So we're selecting this mobile net model, uh, which is a model, which is an Keras H5 model that we have converted into the TensorFlow.js format and that we use here in our application. And then after that, we can just push this predict button and then we get the prediction that 99.97% uh, <laughs> probability this is a strawberry in the image. So let us have a look at what we needed to do in order to uh, in order to make this happen. So first of all, we have, this is our sort of our uh, HTML file where we have some, uh, some progress bar for loading the model and we can select uh, the either the mobile net or the VGD16 model and so on. And then we are also here, we're importing the TensorFlow.js library, as you can see. And we also uh, import something called ImageNet classes and predict. So it's in the predict function that we make our machine learning model come alive here. Um, so whenever we select uh, an image here, we read it into a file reader. And then uh, when we select our machine learning model, we call this function a load model. So in the load model, we are uh, we are loading uh, the model uh, through um, through looking at our directory structure here. So if you look at the directory, you can see here that we have two different directories. We have one called mobile net, and then we have one for VGD16. But in this case, we are using this mobile net model. So then this is actually the result here of our conversion. So when we run this TensorFlow converter command, then we get the model.json file, and then we get some other files that it will use for machine learning. Um, and then when we predict, when we, call, when we click our predict button, uh, then we uh, first need to do some, do some pre-processing of our image, because remember, we need to have it into a TensorFlow uh, format. And then we can just call model.predict with this data and then we will get our predictions and then we just do some uh, some sorting here so we get can get the top five predictions for which for each prediction we will have a probability and we will also have a class name so in this case the class name is actually an uh, a number that we then need to map into a textual representation so the textual rep representation is in this image net classes file so if we have a look here we can see here that for example if it would have been three then that would have meant it was a tiger shark, or if it was four, it was a hammerhead, and so on. And that is basically that's basically it. So, so this is all the code that we needed to do in order to build ourselves an image uh, classifier. Um, yes. Yeah. So let me switch back here again to the browser. So now to summarize this up, yeah. Let me check also if there are some questions. Uh, I'm currently using sequential for my undergraduate, undergraduate major, major project to recognize uh, crochet stitches, but struggling with accuracy. Is there a, is there a better model, better model that you would recommend? Yeah, it's difficult to say. You know, just out of, just you know, without having much more, uh, uh, much more um, information here, because it's uh, uh, it depends highly on what what does it look and what would you would you really like to do. So it's difficult to say something just in general here. But then uh, I, to finish this um, session here, we just have some more real life world example here of how other companies have used TensorFlow.js. So Uber, they have built a debugging tool that they called Uber Manifold. So it uses TensorFlow.js. And if we want to read more about it, you can check the code here on their GitHub repository for Uber slash Manifold. We also have Airbnb. So whenever you want to uh, sublet an apartment through Airbnb, uh, there's always a risk that when you take these pictures that maybe you have some, um, 
there's maybe some confidential or personal uh, identifiable uh, information lying around like your passport or your driver's license. So what Airbnb has done is they run a TensorFlow JS application on the client. So whenever it detects that you are selecting a picture that may have sensitive information, it will give you an alert before you upload it so that you so that you can choose to select a different picture instead. And then we also have from the world of music, we have something called Magenta, which is part of Magenta Studio. And it uses machine learning models in order to make music. So you can find more, more about that using this link here, magenta.tensorflow.org. And I also have some references. If you thought this was interesting and would like to know, would like to know more, uh, you can go to the official TensorFlow uh, TensorFlow uh, documentation. Uh, there is also many different courses on Coursera, but one of the ones that I can recommend for beginners is called Introduction to TensorFlow. And if you want to know more about this image class, uh, classifier uh, example, there is a um, there is a, a video series here on DeepListen that you can follow and also learn much more about it. Then I would like to take the opportunity here, just uh, in the cup in the last minutes here to say a couple of words about this online AI school. Uh, so I'm running together with Eve Party and Gosia Borseka an online AI school called AI42, which is completely free. It's, it's community based. And uh, the way that we run this is that every second Wednesday, we are streaming on uh, our YouTube channel and we have an expert or uh, a recognized uh, speaker um, that are talking about the subject related to machine learning. So we started out with giving the basics. So we've covered, you know, the mathematics, the statistics, the probability calculations, and then we've dived in more into data science, machine learning, deep learning, and also various types of tools, like for example, Power BI or Databricks or Apache Spark and so on. Um, so uh, if uh, so, the goal here is that we would like to provide everyone here with uh, the necessary information so that you can start your career in data science or artificial intelligence. And if this sounds interesting, you can follow us on our um, on our Instagram or on our Twitter or on uh, Facebook. And you can also find all of our previous session on our YouTube channel. So you can scan this QR code here, or if you're interest, interested in our next session, then you can scan this QR code in order to get to our meetup page. So with that said, we've come to the end here of this session. So I would like to thank you so much for attending my session. And if you want to reach me or if you have any more questions, you can reach me either on Twitter where my where my handle is so grab this or you can reach me on this email address that you can find here on this slide. So with that said, I would like to thank you so much and I wish you a very interesting continued Code Bar Festival. <laughs>